This is Tommy Outdoors 81. And this episode of the podcast, once again, was made possible uh, thanks to those lovely folks at Sea Monitor Project at Lost Agencies. And a special shout out to Ross McGill, who uh, made this possible, really, uh, and was our guest on one of the previous episodes, in episode 79, if I remember correctly. And so today we talk with Dr. Patrick Collins and we talk about skates. Uh, I mean, not skates like skating, but skates, those big fish that are critically endangered and we don't know much about. So uh, Patrick is a skate lead uh, in Sea Monitor, and we talk about everything about skates, really about the history and uh, about uh, their habitat. And we talk also about the research that Sea Monitor Uh, does uh, to get a little bit more knowledge about skates. Um, The nice thing is that uh, Patrick is also an angler. So we could uh, also uh, dive a little bit deeper into not purely, not only purely from the scientific standpoint into skate biology, but also uh, from the angler's perspective. And um, we touched on this um, sometimes controversial subject of uh, catching those uh, critically endangered fish uh, and boating them and whether it's good, bad, and what is the, uh, me- how meaningful are those tagging programs and whether those tagging programs that rely on anglers are, you know, more doing more good or bad. Very interesting, not only from the scientific standpoint, but also from the angler's standpoint. So, uh, as usual, before I let you enjoy this episode of Tommy's Outdoors, head on to YouTube and subscribe to Tommy's Outdoors YouTube channel. This podcast is available in a video version on Tommy's Outdoors YouTube channel. And on that channel, there's also a lot of other material, vlogs, gear reviews, etc., etc. So, if you're interested in stuff that we talk about in this podcast, you will be interested in videos that I'm, that I'm publishing on Tommy's Outdoors YouTube channel. And now, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Patrick Collins. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thanks for doing this. Thank you very much, Tommy. Hi. Um, so I, I read that you are a skate lead at C Monitor program. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, C Monitor is a European Union funded interreg program, which th- these are kind of uh, research and community programs on a regional scale. Mm-hmm. So this program is Ireland, Northern Ireland, and Scotland. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a lot of components to it. A lot of it is about setting up these acoustic tracking arrays. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that just today, when we're recording this podcast, just today uh, I published the, the first episode uh, with uh, Ross and, oh. and Fred when they Excellent. were talking about all the technology and all that. So uh, I, I'm not sure now when our episode is going to air, but this is kind of like a, the same thing for people who listened to the previous episode and mm-hmm. they didn't, they should go out and listen to episode 79 first before coming back to this one. <laughs> Excellent. Right. So listen, I, I, just as a, a type of uh, introduction, um, but I, I don't want you to do like a typical introduction. I want you to start like how it came to be. Like, are you always wanted to be a, you know, as a little kid, you were, I want to research, you know, marine fish and marine wildlife one day, and this is how it started? Or whether you, you know, I wanted to be blank here, you know, insert whatever, firefighter or soldier or whatever the kids wants to be. And then there was like a one turning point in your life that, that changed everything. And now you are a researcher for, for marine wildlife. I'm not, not really. I, I grew up on an island called Cove, or a town called Cove in Cork Harbour. So we were always surrounded by the sea, and we grew up uh, sailing boats and fishing and going around rock pools and stuff. And as a kid, I was always interested in biology. I had a room full of fish tanks. So it was a fairly natural progression for me to move 
um, from, you know, I, I spend uh, summers and weekends working in the local wildlife park. Mm -hmm. So it was a fairly natural progression for me to end up doing marine science. Um, it, it's always been there, uh, an yeah. interest in biology for me since I was very, very, very young. Um, and I was always kind of messing around in rock pools and trying to name all the animals and all this sort of uh -huh. stuff from a very, very early. So yeah. it, there was no, there was no huge switch. It, it was just, it was always there. Weirdly enough, I was going to do law at one stage. Aha! Uh -huh. um, <laughs> because I heard it was easy. Oh, and, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, 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 my, I, was, I was going to go to London to do law and then I decided some, some common sense took over and went, no, 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 that's, that's, mm -hmm. do, do, do something, do something that has absolutely no career options and become a marine biologist. <laughs> why, why you say so? You, you, it was, well, was that the kind of like a pressure? I was like, oh, Patrick, what you, what you want to do? There, you know, there, there's don't do weird, this. <laughs> Good there's advice. A very weird, there's a very weird idea, uh, especially in Ireland. Mm -hmm. that marine biology is something that happens in Australia or California, these hot countries. Yes. Um, that that it's, it's only something that happens in the tropics and that it's, and I think a lot of this is down to TV shows mm -hmm. where marine biologists is always in a room full of fish tanks, usually in California. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 but it's not true. Like Ireland is, is in Europe, certainly one of the most diverse areas. Um, mm -hmm. it, we have a huge coastline. We have a huge amount of, uh, of marine life. There are massive amounts of biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And there's a really strong historical and cultural tie to the sea in Ireland that people aren't aware of. Yeah. Or most people aren't. It's, it's almost like it, there's been a... Um, we've forgotten a lot of it. We've forgotten a lot of it. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that historical and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. But no... Um, no, and, and even today, like when I, when I try and talk to the parents of students, like most of my student bodies come from around Belfast, you know, a city mm -hmm. with a massive tied to the sea with the shipbuilding and fishing and all this. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and they still don't see marine biology as a, as a, a real career option. But it's, really? of course really? it is. It's huge. It, it's 95% of the biosphere on the planet. If you want to be a biologist, be a marine biologist. Otherwise, you're studying niche stuff. <laughs> that's, like, that's very good point. That's a very like, good point. <laughs> there's two ways of looking at it, right? You can look at a, 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 a biosphere in which you have bioluminescence, deep sea hydrothermal events, the largest animals in the planet, or you can stick your hand up a cow's arse. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. I generally try and tell the students do something where they can follow their dreams and find some excitement and do some cool stuff, do yeah. a bit of exploration, name a new species, which you can do with marine biology. So it's all still there. And right. in Ireland, Jeepers, there, there's, there's a bigger need now than ever. Like our seas aren't doing well with climate change, industrialized overfishing, all these issues. There, there, there's a lot of issues. and There is a need for more of these students. And, you know, there are jobs out there. There's yeah. tons of jobs out there. Absolutely billions of them. Right. I I see, like I'm surprised that you're, that you're saying that you're even talking to, uh, to, to uh, like, students who are actually already starting and there is a, still this perception. Like, oh, this, Absolutely. Absolutely. This is, this is crazy. This is crazy. So listen, so you were, since, since you, were, you were very young, you wanted to be, you know, you were, it was natural that you're, you were within this space, let's say, and then, so then basically college and then university and that's, that's where you are right now. It, 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 was, it was a weird pathway. So I, I did my undergraduate in Galway. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't a very good undergraduate student. I spent most of my time doing music, to be honest. Um, oh, music. All right. And running and organizing gigs. And, you and, had a I, lot of like, uh, opportunities to choose different career options. Say, a lawyer. I always, or <laughs> I always ended up back looking at fish and worms. So I, I, I was interested in music. Uh, so I set up the Music Society in Galway when I was a student there, which I think is still running. Mm -hmm. um, it was just an excuse to get free booze, really. There, there was <laughs> <laughs> um, then when I left Galway, I, I ended up working uh, as a cook in the Crawford Art Gallery in Cork. That, I wasn't very good at that. Mm -hmm. I, I ended up chopping the tip off one finger and breaking my hand on the other finger. <laughs> I, I wasn't, I was terrible. I was absolutely brutal at it. So um, I decided then that um, I, I would go back and do a master's. So I, I moved to Wales mm -hmm. and I did my master's in marine biology in Wales, which was mm -hmm. a phenomenal experience. It really was. I mean, mm -hmm. It was just my, my first time being surrounded by loads of other people who are into the same sort of thing. Um, and I, that's where I, I actually started my, my passion, which is deep sea biology. Most mm -hmm. of my work for the last 20 years has been deep sea. So I did my master's in Wales, uh, ended up living in Wales, mm -hmm. uh, in a little village called uh, Menai Bridge mm -hmm. for a number of years. And 
I worked for a consultancy to earn my crust. And then I did little odd jobs. Like I did a little bit of consulting in Dublin. Mm-hmm. And I ended up working for a woman called Cindy Lee Van Dover, who was a, a one stage chief astrobiologist at NASA over oh. at Duke University in the US. So she rang me up one day and she was like, Patrick, uh, do you want to go on an adventure? Now, I, I, I emailed her as a student. Like, I was pure mm-hmm. cheeky. And I was just like, yeah, Cindy, uh, what do you think it is for what I'm doing? Yeah. Uh, you know. That's the way to do and, it. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I hadn't a clue what I was doing, but, you know. And so she, she rang me up. She said, hey, Patrick, you want to go on an adventure? It'll be awesome. And I said, grand, without even knowing what it was. So she, uh, she, 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 I, I left Wales, moved to the US, mm-hmm. uh, worked for Duke University for a while. And I ended up basically being her runabout. So, because she, mm-hmm. she was head of the department at Duke University Marine Lab. And she's always a good field biologist. So I ended up being sent out to Papua New Guinea and places like this to kind of yeah. collect samples for her uh, and, and do, like, there was a big deep sea mining operation in Papua New Guinea. They were doing an environmental impact assessment. So I mm-hmm. did the, the biological component to that study, which was amazing. Like, that, was, that was like something out of Star Trek because every time you go, you're using massive or robots uh, in, in very deep water in an area that's practically, yeah. we don't know. So every time you go down, you find new species. Um, so I came back from there, went back to North Carolina, ended up at Embarry for a while, which is the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute mm-hmm. out in Moss Landing, which was a fantastic experience. Mm-hmm. Now that was like living on an episode of Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> everyone had the most amazing white teeth uh, <laughs> and, and everyone was super, like super friendly, super relaxed and just beyond any level of smart that I'd ever experienced in my mm-hmm. life. Like, and they were nice. The thing is, normally you meet kind of these super smart people and they're always a bit weird. These mm-hmm. people were just, they were, they were like Star Trek characters. They're all good looking, white teeth, super smart. And the toys they worked with would blow your mind. Like huh. it, it, was, it was, it really was science fiction stuff. So um, they put me in an office there mm-hmm. and the office overlooked Monterey Bay. And it was an amazing office. And I was just an intern. I was just, you know, a young fellow. And I was like, well, why'd you put me in here? And they were like, look out the window. So I looked out the window. Um, I saw a bunch of dolphins going past, some elephant seals, some sea lions, some flying fish. And then two humpback whales jumped out literally 40 meters from my seat, just jumping, jumping, jumping. And I'm like, Jesus. I'm like, this is insane. And they're like, you get nothing done if you work in that office. That's why you put the new guy in there. <laughs> so eventually, eventually, when they kind of found out I wasn't a complete tosser, they moved me to an office without a window. So I can get <laughs> Um, but no, it was, it was amazing. It was, it oh, was wow. Wow. Uh, and, and I, I guess like I did my degree, I did my masters and I, I was typical of most students that were, are, are largely just cruising mm-hmm. and you have an interest in it, but the really that interest hasn't, uh, flowered really into something serious. It, it was only really when I went to California and, and North Carolina that yeah. the kind of interest moved from something that was more a way to make a living like a job. Cause I was working in consultancy for years beforehand mm-hmm. in, in, into something that I wanted to do for research. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so it, it was amazing. Like, like I'm working with these people at the level, working with the kit and the technology they were working with and going to these parts of the world and exploring. It, mm-hmm. it, it was just an insane. And that's, that's where I met a buddy of mine, Jens Carlson, the Dutch fellow, or the, the, sorry, Dutch, Jupiter, kill me, Swedish, Swedish, mm-hmm. but in a, in a, in a North Carolina. So Jens moved back to Ireland. I convinced him to move to Ireland with his family because he's small kids. And I was like, move to Ireland is great for small kids, <laughs> as opposed to North Carolina. Because the weather there was terrible. There's mosquitoes and, and what they yeah. call them, and bugs, which are just cockroaches everywhere. Uh, but it's a lovely part of the world. So he, he moved back anyway. And then he, when he got set up at UCC, he was like, Pat, you got to come back to Ireland. You just, you just got to. And you need to do your PhD. Mm-hmm. Like you're, 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 you're working at a very high level, with very high people, but you'll never run your own research. You'll always be the lackey unless you do a doctorate. So and mm-hmm. at that stage now, my interest was more in, in, the, in the research was more than just a passing interest. This was something I wanted to dedicate my life to. Gotcha. So uh, after a good few years working, traveling, stuff like that, I went back based on largely my buddy Jens's advice to do a PhD. And mm-hmm. uh, there was, there was a chap called Bob Kennedy in Galway and UIG. Uh, he was like, yeah. You can come work for me. You got a background in consulting and the, the Bentic Ecology stuff. You can help out my group. I'll help out with you get your PhD. So I did that. So I, and I did my PhD in, uh, in deep sea research. Mm-hmm. Then 
part of that was we went out to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge with a guy, Andy Wheeler in UCC, led the expedition with National Geographic and found a new vent site uh, uh-huh. in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Um, and through that, we managed to get money, money from the Science Foundation Ireland for me to do a postdoc mm-hmm. after my PhD in kind of genetics and stuff. So I ended up going full circle and ended up working with Jens in Dublin on this SFI-funded postdoc. Right. That all went very well, and we, 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 we had a great time doing it, blah, blah, blah. And uh, time passes, jobs go on, and I ended up uh, applying for a job in Queens as a lecturer, not expecting to get it. Uh-huh. Uh, I'd never been to Belfast before. I didn't even know they did marine biology in Queens, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> and did the worst interview of my life and got the job, and I've been here since. <laughs> now, what, <laughs> When I came here, it's, it's because I'm in the UK system now. Mm-hmm. Most of the UK deep sea research is based out of Southampton. Yes. So it's, and whereas in Ireland, it's, it's the deep sea research is more split among the different universities and the marine institute. It's much easier, actually, in the South, I found, to get access to the research vessel, to get access to equipment, and, and uh-huh. to collaborate with people. In, in Queens, that just wasn't there for me. So I had to kind of change my focus a bit. So I did what any good lad from Cork does. I went to the pub and talked to people. <laughs> and so uh, we have a marine lab here down in Port of Ferry. And I, I literally just, I, I went to the pub. I, I sat down and said, hey, what's going on with Strangford Lock? Because I'd heard there was issues in Strangford Lock, blah, 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 mm-hmm. blah. And so in Strangford Lock, they had this big horse muscle reef mm-hmm. uh, that was uh, destroyed basically by uh, dredging for, for mm-hmm. scallops. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the reef was, you know, of, of international recognition and importance, and it was protected by European law. So there was infractions; the government had to pay there. There was a lot of acrimony there. Fishing was banned, mm-hmm. uh, and the government tried to monitor to look at recovery of the reef, but the reef didn't seem to be recovering, despite all the money and effort that was being put into it. So I, I was like, eh, this is something I could look at. Mm-hmm. This is something I can get into. So I, I started talking to people, and I, I think. And this comes from probably my experience working on offshore boats, working with a lot of fishermen. Um, that to get to, to understand the situation fully, you have to get, come at it from all angles. You yes. have to get a, a kind of good holistic view of what happened. So I tried to talk to the fishermen, some of the, the locals, and get different opinions, some of which were crazy, some of which made sense. Mm-hmm. And, and, and more and more, I found out stories about this large fish that lived in the lock, um, the skate, uh-huh. that disappeared before the dredging happened. And I was like, oh, well, what's this? Now, I'm a deep sea biologist. I don't work on sharks. I don't work on whales. Uh-huh. I, was, I was curious. So I found out a bit more about it. And it, 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 it turned out that this was an animal that was uh, a target of trophy fishing mm-hmm. uh, in the 70s. And local men's clubs would go out fishing the weekend. And mm-hmm. if they caught a prize skate, uh, they'd get a little silver uh, button for their lapel. Wow. It was quite a prestigious thing if you were in an angling club at the time. Well, um, the problem here is that the only way they had of measuring the price skate was to take it out of the water and weigh it, which mm-hmm. was a good night for the skate. Yeah. And so they did. And, and like, you, you got to understand these guys, th- th- there was no animosity towards the skate by these guys. It was just something to do and fish or fish. And, you know, yeah. Use yeah. an exhaust. Pool. So, so they did what they did. Unfortunately, the skate, um, their life history is quite different to say a mackerel or a cod. Mm-hmm. And they... They live quite a long time. They reproduce very slowly. There appears to be some form of territoriality there. There's a lot of light and evidence to suggest mm-hmm. there are. So once you wipe them out in an area, it's difficult for them to come back. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. this was on top of a huge decline in the species from the 1920s until like the 1970s. They were hammered by industrial. Yeah. Pollution. I but saw a- I saw a few few uh, days ago like an article with the old photo of a, of a, a two or three gentlemen at the pier and like a massive amount of skate just oh, yeah, landed yeah, yeah. On, 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 the, on, the, on the pier. And, yeah. and like, okay, listen, so we're jumping ahead, we're jumping ahead a little bit uh, and okay. going into the skate. So, so here you are, uh, head lead, skate lead, as it was, you, you were introduced to me. Uh, and that sounds way cooler than it actually is. It sounds like I should be in a kind of, what, what's that movie where they're all on rollerblades fighting each other in the 1980s? I don't know. Oh, you want, you want. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, listen, Parik. So um, obviously we established that you are an expert. Now, first thing, first question I would like you to clarify for our listeners is what are the species of skates? And what is the difference between skates and rays? Because I know that some 
rays that are anglers calling, oh, it's a, you know, whatever, whatever ray, it's actually a skate and it's a, then, so what are the differences? And then when we talk about skates, what are the skates? And, and I also know that there is a, there are two species of skates that were, that they, they were not long ago thought that this is one in the same species. I think it's a white skate or, or something. Really? If, you can, if you can lay it out, all, all that stuff. For okay. us. So the difference between skates and rays is something I always get asked. And it's very similar to the difference between a prawn and a shrimp. No. Uh -huh. There's not. These are just local names for the, for animals. They're 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 really? vernacular. Yeah, yeah. Now some people say that a skate has a fatter tail, that a ray has a thinner tail, that a skate has got uh, spikes in it, whereas a ray has got a barb. Meh. It, it's it's it's, it's uh, tomatoes, tomatoes, sort of thing. Um, really? There. If if you want to understand the difference between these animals, you, you got to go a bit deeper in, mm -hmm. which means you got to look at the taxonomy of them. And that's a very scientific way of separating these animals into groups based on relatedness and kind of evolutionary history. Mm -hmm. Now, the skates, the animals that most people here refer, for instance, a thornback ray yes. or a thornback skate are the same animal, Raja Clavata. All right? Mm -hmm. A, what's the big, a manta ray. Manta, yeah. That's a ray. No one would ever call it a skate because it's a long, long, thin tail. But as for in Ireland, the ray, like, you know, when you get a ray wing in Dublin, it's probably from a thornback. Mm -hmm. Now, if the fisherman's in Dublin, he'll call it a thornback ray. If the fisherman's down south, he might call it a thornback skate. Yeah. Other fish might call it a roker. So it, it's, th these terms are, 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 they're kind of meaningless, really. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just labels people put on them in the vernacular. If you want to really understand them, you got to start calling them by the Latin terms. Yeah, that's the only real way of separating them out. Um, so, like when we're talking about skate, the skate that I'm working with, I'm talking about the larger species of skate. Mm -hmm. So, not the small ones. You're, I'm not talking about the peacocks or the, the undulates or, or the thornbacks or the small eyes or the blondes. They're all the small guys. They're mm -hmm. usually in the genus Raja. Mm -hmm. The species I'm looking at would be much bigger individuals uh, and they're in different, they're in the genus Dipterus, mm -hmm. Bathy Raja and Rostra Raja. Okay. Now these are all much larger animals. Than so they're... there are three genuses of them. Oh, there's loads of genus. There's oh, loads okay. of genuses. There's tons, there's tons, there's tons. Okay. In okay. Irish waters, where, and remember I, I was talking earlier about how, how, how amazingly diverse Irish waters are. Yes. They really, really are super diverse. So when we look at these large giant skate, We've got in Dipturus, we have, you know, we, we've Dipturus intermediates, which is the flapper skate, which is the one we're looking at in, 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 at the moment. Yeah. Uh, that's the largest skate species in the world. Mm -hmm. It's largely coastal. Uh, and and that, that, that lives from basically down Union Hall up as far as uh, the Shetlands. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe a bit towards the Faroes as well. We're not sure. Yeah. You've got Dipturus flasada. Although the, 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 the names even in Latin and these are, are, are currently in flux. That's the blue skate. Mm -hmm. That's the one you get further off uh, shore in Cork. You'll also get it on the porcupine. Um, and that seems to be a very similar species to the flapper skate, but it's, it's quite a bit smaller mm -hmm. and lives in deeper water. Yes. Now, th these animals look very similar superficially, mm -hmm. but genetically they're quite distinct and their life history appears to be quite distinct as well. So the flapper skate, they're both, oh yeah, and, and there, there's a whole lot of other ones. There's the white skate and there's the long nose skate and the black skate, the Norwegian skate, the pallet skate, the Richardson skate, multiple genera in Irish waters. Like, in, like at the moment I'm working on a, on a Bathy Raja. I'm still not sure if they're Richardson or Pallada because even the genetic struggles to tell them apart, but we know their, their size difference are quite different. Of course, it's very difficult and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So it, it's, the take home message here is raising skates, not a really useful term to use, especially mm -hmm. for management. Useful if you're going angling for him, you catch it. Oh, I got a ray, I got a skate, fine. Yeah. Uh, but, but in terms of management, you, you got to break it down to the scientific name, the, the, based on the Linnaean, Linnaean key. Um, in terms of the ones we get in Ireland, we get loads. We, we've got some of the most diverse waters, in, certainly in the North Atlantic, for these species. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got three genera of very, very large skate living in, in, in Irish waters. Um, and, and each of them, there's multiple species. Now, the one that people catch, they refer to as a common skate. Yes. The common skate 
is the one that we're concentrating most of our work on and research focus on at the moment. And that's the one where the, the EU Interreg funded sea monitor program is, is looking at as well. That species is, all right, okay, so it's critically endangered, which we'll go on to later on, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's a taxonomic mess. <laughs> so what happened is in the 19th century and beforehand, the fishermen split them all into different groups because they could tell them apart because they worked with them all the time. Mm -hmm. Then an English scientist in, I think, 1924, Smith, I think was his name, he decided, eh, these all look the same. So he was what's known as a lumper. So in taxonomy, you've got lumpers and you've got splitters. Thank lumpers you very much. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that. You're the first guest on my podcast who actually made that distinction. Lumpers and splitters. Okay, yeah, yeah, so, fantastic. So your, lump, your lumpers just shove everything together. Go, man, that's good enough. Your splitters look, oh, these are different. Now, this guy was a lumper, but he made a mistake that these animals are actually quite distinct genetically in terms of their, 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 their physical differences, uh, where they, the, the space they occupy, the niches they occupy are quite different. Mm -hmm. um, so he made a mistake. However, that has had implications for the management because these animals are all just called common skate. Now, when it comes into fisheries management, it gets even more or confusing. So, sorry to catch you up. And is, is at that point, the common skate is also Latin name, only one species? Oh, the, the common skate could be Rajabatis, Dipturus batis, it could be anything. Yeah, but at the moment in time where, where we are under influence of that lumper guy, yeah. is, is, there, is there still distinction uh, in the Latin names? Or, no, or they we were, say they like were, common skate, one Latin name, that's it? That one Latin name, yeah. They were lumped okay. together for one Latin name. So okay. they were considered one species. Okay. So so now now another question, because you mentioned that, but the fishermen, they were recognizing different species. Were yes. they were they correct? Were yes, they, the fish, uh, they, the okay, were correct. so at that at that moment the fishermen were actually had a like a more developed knowledge than yes. scientists. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So last question on this. Uh, from the perspective of angling, because it's like an angler catches catches skate, it's like oh, it's a skate, it's a common skate. Not not all of them, not all of them, but not all of them. Yeah. So there is a question, because fishermen were able to distinguish the species, then I get it that that really dedicated angler can also tell which skate they caught. Oh, blue... absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, we'll we'll get to that later on. So absolutely. Then just just yeah. carry on with you. Sorry, I was just wanted to clarify that because it it it. it you know, goes away. What was I talking about? I, I tend to ramble. Oh, you were you were talking about the the the, the uh, impact on the management of, oh, yeah. of the okay. lumping so, in them into one species. So there was so much confusion with these animals that they were all just lumped in as, for fisheries management terms, as skate. Yeah. Any large skate was just a skate. That included all the other species that I talked about earlier: the 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 the, the Dipterus nigerensis, Dipterus flossata, Dipterus intermedius. Even some of the bathy raja or also they're all just for fisheries purposes landed as skate. That meant we, we we had there was a we didn't really know much about them. Now we knew very little about their ecology. We still don't know very much about their ecology. Um, but because they were all lumped together, uh, I, I guess it gave the impression that there was probably more of these animals than there actually was. Mm -hmm. That was my thought. That that was my yeah. thought. That, oh, we have plenty of them. Yeah, yeah. there may be like one species that you actually almost have none. <laughs> Well, but the problem here is that um, because they occupy different areas as well, they would go, oh, we fished them out here, but there's still plenty over here. So yeah. we fished these guys. So what they were doing there was driving two species to out. Mm -hmm. Well, not, not to extinction yet. E extirpation, which is a big difference between extinction and extirpation. Extinction yeah. is, is, is a word that people throw, in, in my book, throw around far too easily. That they say this species is extinct. Extinct is dead. There's mm -hmm. no coming back from extinct. Yes. Extirpated means it's wiped out from an area. Yeah. Now, it might be in other areas. It might lo have lost a lot of genetic diversity, but it's still <laughs> there. And there's still a potential for recovery. Gotcha. The animals we're looking at, the skate, they've been extirpated from large parts of their range. Mm -hmm. They haven't been driven to extinction. So they're not extinct in the Southern North Sea or the Irish Sea. They've been extirpated from these areas. Mm -hmm. So there is still potential for them to recover and to get back in. Mm -hmm. um, now, what, what we saw is that these animals were... were not very well managed, I guess, by the fisheries. And largely not, not anything deliberate again. And you, you can't kind of suggest that there was some sort of war against skate going on. <laughs> it was just based on poor science, poor information, mm -hmm. and people just fish and fish and fish because they like 
they didn't know any better. Yeah. And these fish disappeared. Now, it was recognized that these were a species under threat as far back as the 1920s. No. Um, because they started disappearing, and it was in the 1970s, really, that we saw a real precipitous decline, or recognized precipitous decline in these groups, mm-hmm. um, uh, until today, where we're now, uh, like, a lot of these species are critically endangered. Now, critically endangered is some, you, uh, critically endangered is um, the species in a, is, in, is in a bad way. In a really yeah, bad way. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, one, that's, that's one, one step from extinct. One step from extinct. Well, what, what it means is that it's gone from most of its range and the number of individuals is way, way down. Yeah. Now, th- th- Does it th- include the size as well? That the size is, uh, is, is, is the size no. a factor in this classification? No. I think the, no, not really. No. It's, it's just the, the, the numbers, the, the genetic diversity and all that. Now, there's an issue with this as well that what we have are known as shifting baselines. Hmm. You know, sh- you, you might be aware oh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. something that we were... That we were uh talking about many times on the podcast where yeah. you know like a new normal and it's like, yeah, okay normal. but if you if you could see what your what your grandfather was catching you wouldn't you wouldn't think that you had a good day fishing no you, like, like you would it, say it, it, it was absolutely crap because what he was doing is like, huge animals huge like if you go to almost every irish pub on the coastline in ireland that, that's beside a, a pier you'll see a picture in the back in black and white of some lad holding up a skate I've seen my own uncles in pictures in bars in Cove holding flapper skate caught in Cork Harbour. Yeah. Now, there hasn't been a flapper skate in Cork Harbour in decades. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we forget that these animals were there. And, and so they disappear from our public consciousness. Yeah. And if, if they disappear from our public consciousness, we're not aware of there. But there, there's more effects than this. You're talking about a very large predator mm-hmm. in shallow water, mm-hmm. a very, probably the largest demersal predatory fish, an apex predator essentially in our coastal habitat that we have wiped out from our entire coastline. And there's huge implications from wiping these animals out because you, 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 you precipitate trophic cascades. Yeah. Uh, so, and we really don't understand the, 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 the effects of right. losing species. Right. We really right. don't. Right. Uh, and, and this is our shifted basin that we, we consider what we have now as a new normal. We have, like if you're if you're an angler, you go. Oh, there's loads of dogfish. That's the new normal. That yes. should be, things in situations like this shouldn't be the new normal. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's even like for uh, shark angling, where where uh, now when you're going for a shark fishing trip, like you you targeting your blue shark. Yeah. But a number of years ago, the blue shark was considered like a bycatch, like a like a, oh, yeah. I don't want them because they were catching mako sharks. That was yeah. the shark to catch. But now it's you know. Last macro was caught like what in seventies or something like that. But there's there's the implications for the wider ecosystem are massive in terms of the ecosystem mm-hmm. services provided. So so if you look at this large, let's look at the Yellowstone project in in in, in California, mm-hmm. where they brought wolves back. Now they brought wolves back, and people were worried about the elk, which are like a type of giant reindeer. Yeah. Yeah. They were like, oh my god, we're bringing the wolves back. They're going to eat all the elk. <laughs> of course, <That's> <laughs> you know everyone loves the elk. Didn't work out like that. So what, what happened, and it, it worked out very differently to how people thought, mm-hmm. that the wolves affected the behavior of the elk a little bit by consumption, but mm-hmm. most of it was through fear. Yes. And this is the big thing. Yes. They, they controlled the elk entirely by changing their behavior through fear. Yeah. Now, the change in behavior of the elk meant they weren't grazing on riverbanks, uh, they weren't grazing uh, shrubs out, so allowed trees to regrow, riverbanks to recover, riverbanks recover, consolidates the sediment, that allows trout to come back, that allows certain types of dragonflies, frogs, newts, the whole shebang comes back. So you see a massive flowering in biodiversity through the reintroduction of one, of a handful of apex predators. And yeah. these apex predators regulate the system through fear. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something that, 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 that people have to get their head around. And if we look at our system, we've taken out our largest benthic predator. Mm-hmm. That would, yeah. I'd imagine, we don't know because there's no way of measuring this at the moment, of regulating its ecosystem through fear. So we, we've probably lost a lot of the biodiversity in our coast because of this. Because well. of this, yeah. So you're, you're, you already kind of touched, touched on that. On, so how much do we know about the behavior and, and biology of those skates? Or are there like very elusive and we don't really know much or do we have like a some understanding of you know what's their what's their life history and and you know how they behave 
we, we know some. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the big problem in it is a lot of, because of the confusion between the different species, especially in the common scale grouping, that mm-hmm. people have been making mistakes about. Was that fixed? Was that corrected? That oh, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, about, about, about uh, 2010, a paper by a chap called... 2010? Yeah. It's very recent. It's like 10 oh, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. And in, in most uh, fisheries management, they're still all lumped in together as one group. Yeah. And this yeah. is... But these things take... These are... This is something that, you know, takes a while to change. It's mm-hmm. not like these things can happen overnight. Um... What was I on about? What was I uh, on the behavior, and do we know the behavior? Oh, yeah. In terms of the behavior, yeah, so, so th- there's an issue there in, in, in that a lot of what we knew anecdotally from fishermen, what mm-hmm. were they talking about? What species? We're not sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the previous studies, we don't. Mm-hmm. Um, there has been a lot of work, a, a lot of it by the Scots, they, they have an MPA in Loch Sunnert. Uh, they've been doing a lot of work there. and uh, you know they, They've been looking at movement of these animals and, and stuff, but meh. But if we talk to the fishermen, what do we know from the fishermen? We know that they live in uh, deep holes, rocky mm-hmm. grounds. Now, we, if we look historically, now then the fishermen said these animals live in deep holes and rocky grounds. Mm-hmm. But is this because these are refugia from fishing? Because these are the only places where they're not getting nailed by fishing boats. Yes. Or is this the actual preferred habitat of the animal? I would argue that considering these animals were found a lot in the North Sea, Irish Sea, and even as far as Cork Harbour, probably not. Yeah. These are refugia. That these animals, yeah. if their numbers were decent, would live probably almost everywhere. Right. Um, are they a deep water species? Not particularly. Mm-hmm. Uh, it depends where you look. The, uh, from, from what I know, the largest skate in Ireland was caught in Strangford Lock uh, that was stranded in, at, at low tide. All right. Right. Uh, Listen. So, what, while we while we at the at the deep water, can you distinguish for us what is considered deep water yeah. and what is considered deep sea? Oh, uh, again, this is the shrimp and the prawn question. Uh-huh. Um, for for me, uh, deep like you've got your coastal belt, mm-hmm. and then you, that runs out to the continental shelf down to about two hundred meters deep. Yeah, that to me is still shallow. That's okay. continental shelf stuff. And then once you go off the continental shelf, you drop down the Atlantic to about 3,000 meters. That's deep. Okay. So for me, anything below 1,000 meters would be deep. Okay. Gotcha. gotcha. Uh, but, you know, if I'm swimming, oh, uh, yeah. any, anything, anything more than the height of my nose is deep. <laughs> So it's relative, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm, obviously, I'm, I'm asking about the, you know, scientific terms. And, and you yeah, know, again, when, someone, when someone is saying, like, oh, are, there, are there deep water species? Like, what do you mean, deep water species? Yeah. And, and now it's- well, I guess what I would have meant is, you know, these terms are, are, are quite relative. A shallow water species, I, I guess, I know, if you're in a pub conversation, would be 50 meters or less. Deep right. water species is 50 meters. Well, I don't know. But like, mm-hmm. To me, to me, these are meaning these terms, your, 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 your coastal or your continental shelf or your, mm-hmm. you know, you've gotcha. got variations in all these habitats. Anyway. Gotcha, gotcha. Listen, um, as an angler, how, how it is possible to distinguish what species of skate you caught? If you caught a skate, um, how, what's the best way? Because obviously, yeah, I, I can imagine you go out on a fishing trip and a skipper puts you to the, you know, uh, deep uh, rocky hole you you cash a skate and it's like oh come on skate great right and now if you want to go this one step further like what is the best way to go about identifying what is the actual skate that you caught well first of all you'd look at where you were mm-hmm. now if you're in the US it's not going to be a flapper skate it's probably a barn door skate mm-hmm. if you're on this side of the Atlantic mm-hmm. If you're, say, in Scotland, it's going to be a flapper skate. As far as we know, we don't get blue skate in Scotland. If you're in Ireland, mm-hmm. depending on where you are, if you're from, say, Galway down, you might have a blue skate or a flapper skate mm-hmm. if you're fishing for them. But there's also, like, for, for, to be honest, the best advice I can give to people is to download some of the shark trust guides. Yes. 
and, and they have got some fantastic pictorials because what we're talking in Ireland is maybe seven different species. And for me to describe to you the differences between mm -hmm. these animals would be incredibly boring. No, I'm, I'm more looking up for the, for the, for the guideline like that, like, oh, download a guide for a shark trust. And they're, yeah. they're excellent. And they're, they're super. And, and, and we had uh, Ali Hood from Shark Trust on the podcast yeah. as well. Uh, so they, and, and to be honest, the, the more the anglers can, can bring themselves up to speed, because we rely on the anglers to collect data for us. Ah, uh, what, an, what an, ex with an excellent kind of pivot or segue, segue <laughs> to, to the role of, of, of anglers. And yeah. um, I don't know, I, I probably can just let you talk, but I want you kind of to set it up with a, with a question. And, and I am most interested in what is the role of anglers and you know because we had and actually probably that that whole series of the podcast with C Monitor and with you and with other people started a conversation where it was a it was a picture or a video of a skate landed uh, by an angler and there were like comments like oh they're critically endangered why they're doing this oh they're tagging well and the whole you know the usual conversation so now from your perspective as a scientist who actually works on skate. What's your, what's your position, what's your view about the importance of anglers and what they do, what they don't, what they should do, et cetera, et cetera? Okay. I grew up on a town which there was a lot of fishing. Mm. I grew up fishing for mackerel, for pollock, you name it, that sort of stuff. Um, friends of mine have tried to get me fly fishing, but I, I generally, I like fishing. You know, I, still, I, you're still fishing? I do, yeah. I was in, oh, I was in, uh, I was in Tonga earlier on this year. Look oh. at some sea volcanoes. Oh my God! You should see some of the fish I caught there. So oh, I can imagine. I can we, imagine. We, we what was there? Jacks? Oh, wahoo! Wahoo! Oh! And uh, we were just catching them, and, and then we'd eat them for the lunch. Baddest, the baddest mackerel in the ocean. Oh, it's like a mackerel on steroids. A huge yeah. animal. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I learned recently that that dog tooth tuna is also a mackerel. It's not a yeah, tuna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. again, it's. That one is the baddest mackerel. I don't know, these wahoos are pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Wahoo too, yeah, yeah, I know. We, we, okay, we, we're kind of <laughs> drifting away from those. Okay. But, but anyway, 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 to get to get back to the point in terms of the, the distinction between the scientist and the yeah. angler. Yeah, we, we established that you are also an angler. Yes, the, the angler can be a scientist at the same time. And the scientist Absolutely, the it's angler. quite natural. It's quite natural. Um, for, I, I haven't gone fishing for skate. It's not something that would appeal to me because largely I fish to eat, right? Mm -hmm. I, I like... I like I don't know, call it a primal thing, but if I catch something, I like to stick it in a pan mm -hmm. with a bit of butter and, and, and mm -hmm. munch on it, right? It's just, it's just a thing, yeah. Uh, but I appreciate that some people do like to, to catch the fish, they like to hold the fish and stuff like this. And I, and I understand that emotion. Mm -hmm. I understand the desire to, to, to be in close to nature and be in contact with nature. It's an important part of being alive. Yeah. Um, so so I, I totally appreciate that. In terms of where the anglers fit into what we do, we're all after the same thing. Like the, the anglers want to fish for the skate. They want the skate to be there so their children can fish for the skate, so their children's children can fish for the skate. It's not like the anglers, and, and, and I, I know some of the more anti-angler brigade will go, oh, they're just out to kill the fish. They're not. It, it, it's, it's an experience they're looking for. They want the fish to, to, to be there, unless you're an angler like me who wants to eat it. But most of them want to put the fish back alive. So but, but still, they need to be there in the first place. Exactly. So So... In my book, good anglers, responsible anglers are also the frontline soldiers of conservation. They really are. Because awesome. awesome. They, that's, 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 they, that's a great thing to say. <laughs> no, but of course they are. Of course they are. They're hardly going to try and destroy the very thing they love. Um, now, in, in terms of how I work with anglers, we couldn't do our work without the support of the angling community. Like, it's not like, like, no, we got a huge budget for the Sea Monitor program, okay? Mm -hmm. That is to do genetics. Mm -hmm. That is to employ scientists to process data. We're doing satellite tracking. We're putting up acoustic arrays and looking at the movement of the animals around there. We're, we're, we've got these regional workshops. All these things cost money. That's where our money goes. We don't have money to go out every day angling for skate. Mm -hmm. There's just not enough. The, the budget that size would cost millions and millions and millions. We just don't have that much money. Mm -hmm. So we have to work with the angling community. We're entirely dependent on the angling community to get the information, to collect the data, to support our work. 
Wow. And I'd like to think that the angling community looks at us as developing the science that will inform the policy that will support the, the, the continuation of their hobby. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or, or yeah. for, for the charter boats and livelihood. So yeah. it's like we're not in a position, we're not in a, 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 as far as I'm concerned, my group's not, not trying to shut down angling. Mm-hmm. In many ways, I promote it. The more yeah. angling, the better. Because if there's more anglers, that's a healthy fish stock. And if yes. the anglers are educated, that's more data we have to manage yeah. the stock even better. Yeah. Um, wow. So it's, 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 it's they're, they're one, of, I, I would regard it all as one and the same thing. Yeah. How do you, how do you, uh, because you said that you rely on the anglers uh, for that. So is it, is it through the uh, program of you, you working with charter skippers or you reach out to anglers directly? Um, so th- there are programs in place. Uh, I know we work quite closely with Inland Fisheries Ireland and uh-huh. with the Marine Institute. So we have to work with these guys because otherwise there's too many different organizations stepping in each other's toes. Yes. And if, if we didn't all work together as well, you're going to have three or four programs with data going everywhere. That data gets lost. Mm-hmm. By working with the Inland Fisheries in Ireland, there's, they have all the contacts as well. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and they've got the experience and they've got data sets going back decades. Yes. Yes. Like those, the data they're collecting is phenomenal. What we're doing is piggybacking on that using their, their network of contacts um, and and they're, they've got a fly tagging program that they've been running quite successfully for a long time. So we're piggybacking on that. Are they, what's what's the what's the pro, that program? As are these those those yellow the tags? Tag, the little plastic. Ah, so they're used for something after all. Oh, absolutely. Because, because absolutely. I heard because I heard that like oh, as far as I know, there's no no use for them, and this is just tagging for tagging's sake. Absolutely not. Absolutely. Okay, not. I'm 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 glad we could debunk that uh, that these these famous yellow little plastic tags that no. are on on skates and sharks that are actually valuable data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's data that, that's, that we can use, of course. Because awesome. yeah, we, can, we can look at, see, like if we catch the fish multiple times, that'll give us an indication of the residency of the skate. If we catch one, now the, the, the tags, there's issues with the different types of tags, of course. Mm-hmm. With, the, with the big yellow cattle tags, there's issues with them. But, you know, it's not like anyone's got all the answers. These things are continually evolving. It's only through, like, the, the skate working group that we set up. Mm-hmm. where we get feedback from fishermen, anglers, government people that we can come gotcha. to the best practice. So like we're still developing best practice for these approaches. Yeah. But the other thing that we have with the anglers um, is that we're, we're setting up a program where they collect at the same time as putting a fly tag in a small little genetic sample. Uh-huh. Now the genetics is super powerful. The genetics will get, get, give us an indication of the, uh, the effective population size of skate in Ireland. It'll give us an indication of how how how, how healthy our population mm-hmm. are, or, or, or how what what condition they're in. Yeah, um, I, I'm I'm looking for that, that to me is a is a massive part of our work, um, and that really is the the gold standard in terms of conservation. If we can get yeah. decent amounts of data back, decent number of samples from as many. So how does that work? So who who can collect that that genetic data? How does we, that we, work? This goes through the same IFI tagging program. So I, I think uh, okay. it's the same guys who are doing the fly tags. Uh, our, our man in the, the IFI sends, sends out, the, we, we give him the kits, he sends them out for us. Okay, so then probably, again, the charter skippers yeah. can, can subscribe to that, get it, get it. And how does it work? Are you, are you, are you taking the tissue sample from the, from the fish? Or? We take a tiny little clip, yeah, using a scissors into a jar of ethanol, and that uh-huh. gets labeled with the fly tag label. Uh-huh. So that means we can link the genetics to the fly tag, understand the movement and the residency of the animal based on if it's really caught or not. Uh-huh. That's a, quite a powerful tool. Yes. Um, so that's one thing we're doing. Um, now we're, so we're, that's an all Ireland approach. Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing we're doing is, is putting uh, acoustic, now the, this, the, the second one is, is, is a big, big, probably a bigger part of our project than the genetics. Um, this is putting in acoustic arrays Mm-hmm. Um, one, I think we're, we're work, looking at Clue Bay, we're looking at a, a site on the north coast, uh, mm-hmm. we're working with the government in the north area, DERA, yeah. to decide where... This, to, is, this is the ocean tracking network uh, equipment. Network. Mm-hmm. Well, we're setting up mini arrays as well. So mm-hmm. the, the larger networks will track the skate as they move, uh, you know, between regions. But mm-hmm. we're setting up smaller little arrays in, in specific sites as well to, to, look, to understand residency and movement of the skate within small discrete areas. Right, right. We're working with the Scots 
in Loch Sunnert, where they have a, an MPA for skate up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're looking at a site on the north coast uh, of Northern Ireland, uh, which they are quite interested uh, because th- there's a lot of evidence, for, again, informed mm-hmm. by the anglers. <laughs> the anglers community have told us that there's, this is a good mark for skate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so based on their information, we're going to try and put an acoustic array down, tag the skate there to see if the skate are resident, what exactly they're doing there. Now, if we find it's ecologically important, then DERA can then push that forward and, and try and put in specific management procedures for the fish in the area. Right, right. Now, that, that wouldn't affect the anglers, but it, it would stop maybe, you know, if someone wanted to put a wind farm there, they couldn't, or if they wanted a dredge there, they couldn't. So right. it's a question of maintaining the fish or the, the, the species in that area because what we're finding out more is this term known as essential fish habitats. Mm-hmm. Okay, now an essential fish habitat is a discrete area that's critical for the viability of that species. Right. So in terms of skate, the critical areas are, you know, where, where we have a decent population of adults, that, that is a viable population, but also, and this is, I've got another cruise going on, hopefully we'll put the application for the Marine Institute, a Netflix one to film it, hmm. is egg laying sites. Huh. Because egg laying sites are probably the most, you know, vulnerable and critical of the habitats for these species because you can have multiple females using the same site year after year laying eggs. The eggs take a huge amount of time to hatch. And if that site is damaged or destroyed in some way, yeah. you've lost an entire cohort of, yeah. of species that are critically endangered species. Yeah. So what we're doing our best, I've got a PhD student uh, who's doing some species distribution modeling. We've also put in some proposals to look, to try and characterize what are the key characteristics of an egg nursery or an egg, uh, egg lay, skate egg laying site. Uh, we know there's some fantastic sites in Orkney. Orkney is essentially the, the first skate at the moment seems to be. Mm-hmm. That place. Yeah, yeah, that place for them. Uh, but we do have sites in, in the Republic where we have skate laying eggs as well. Not, not, mm-hmm. not as big, but we, we do have known sites. Mm-hmm. And so we're trying to characterize these because if the species does recover, uh, it would be interesting to know, like, do, you know, do, do we have sufficient numbers of these sites to support the recovery? Yeah. How about how important for identifying those egg laying sites? How important are those uh, initiatives like, you know, great egg case hunt? And oh, all massive. These absolutely massive. And of course, there's Sarah Varian's Marine Dimensions. Crew. Because I am, I am wondering, you know, is that egg case can be carried, you know, for, for hundreds and hundreds of miles? And the yeah. fact that I'm going to find it on the beach doesn't mean anything? Not, not really. Not really. Um, from, from our, like, no, there's going to be a bit of that. There's going to be a bit of them just washed up miles and miles and miles away. That, that can happen, for sure. Uh, but what we're seeing in Orkney and the other areas is mass strandings of egg cases. Mm-hmm. Now, we're, we're like tens, hundreds of egg cases on the beach. Mm-hmm. And when we look in the egg cases, we're still finding yolk. Or we're oh. finding eggs, eggs washed up with, with embryos still inside. Mm-hmm. They didn't wash up very far away. Yeah, They didn't come from 100 miles away. They came yeah. from miles away. Yes. Oh, miles, cheapest kilometers, whatever. <laughs> but it's, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, the, uh, the evidence would suggest that the, if we're finding big amounts of eggs being washed up, or egg cases, empty egg cases, then the, mm-hmm. the egg laying site isn't far away. It's in the right. area. And, and you right. can kind of work out from, from a little bit of Sherlock Holmesing <laughs> where the egg, cases, egg case site would be. Like, what, what did a skate need? They need, uh, if it's warmer water, better. It was faster maturation of the egg. Are they going to lay the egg cases in muddy areas? No, because the chances are the egg's going to get covered in mud and suffocate and die. And also it's anoxic. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to need an area that has uh, is, oh, yeah, higher flow, slow water flow. It's going to be high, isn't it? Because you want a lot of oxygen for that egg. Yeah. If it's high water flow, then you're talking about an area where it's a uh, very bare rock. Mm-hmm. Now, also... The egg case, they take about, we don't know how long, but anything between six months and a year, depending on temperature to mature to hatch. From, wow, from, from that's a long hatching. time. We, we think, we're not sure. Mm-hmm. But uh, if that's the case, then the egg's going to have to be in an area with high current flow, but securely wedged into an area. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about boulder fields, scree fields, areas with large rocks. Yeah. Um, so these are the sort of areas we need to be looking at, and these are the sort of areas where we do when we do find skate eggs. That's kind of where we see them. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, 
So I have two two other questions. I don't know uh, kind of which one which one goes first. So obviously through the through your research and through through the through the uh, data that you're gathering, you hoping to influence the a management of fisheries on the on the on the larger scale. Do you think that uh, current management is insufficient or is lacking? Or, or do you think it's a reasonably good job or is it like terrible job or is it like no management at all? How do you see that? Uh, well, well, first of all, we don't try and influence, we inform. Uh, we, 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 we're scientists, so, so we're, we're not an NGO. Um, we're not a conservation body. We, 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 we're trying to understand, do research on the species. That right. research can inform management. If, 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 the local government saw or the government so desires to use this information. Yeah. That's the problem, right? That you have like a pile of scientific data that says you should do X and then well, uh, you know, there, you're not doing role, X because there there's, a role here, there's a role here for NGOs like the Irish Wildlife Trust, the World Wildlife mm -hmm. Fund. Mm -hmm. um, they're basically the lobbyists. They're, they're the people do, do, doing this sort of work. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's not like we protect these animals in, in a kind of complete, vacuum mm -hmm. there's legislation in place european legislation international legislation international agreements that enforce that 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 that, 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 that tell us that we have to protect and manage these species mm -hmm. it's not like anyone's doing it the government's doing it because they just love fish mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> because they have to do it mm -hmm. um now it's the role of the the the, the you know, the NGOs and all that to kind of police the government as well, you know, because someone's got to kind of go, hey, you're not doing your job here. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think like the NGO sector in Ireland, for some reason, has traditionally been quite small. Uh, whether that's a lack of funding and support, I'm not sure. Like compared to Northern Ireland, it's minuscule. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's, there's some sort of post-colonial thing going on there that's beyond the scope of this podcast. Mm -hmm. But um, it's stronger. Uh, NGO sector in Ireland would be beneficial uh, yeah for, but that that that's outside that's not my job like my right. job is to do research to, to, right. to do right. the science now sure. without, without the science yeah. without that information you have nothing yeah I mean, well, you can apply a precautionary approach of course and kind of we know nothing so we should do this mm -hmm. we really do need this sort of basic research to inform management and also to inform uh the ngo sector uh, so, so that they can decide what, what, how best to, to move forward on this. Right. In, in terms of how to scale or manage it, like what, what can you expect? We, we know so very little about them. It's only mm -hmm. 2010 that we realized that there was two different species. <laughs> um, there's, you know, it, it, it's, we can't do every. You can't have everything. All that's the time. A, that kind of answers the question, uh, in not not in an indirect way, right? Well, how do you think we do at the at the skate management? Well, we just it's a ten years since we actually realized how many species we have. <laughs> I, I, I think you got to realize that there's a recognition that these species are under severe threat. Mm -hmm. uh, there are there is money being put into understanding. The ecology, physiology, and, and, and conservation status of these species. That's reflected in things like the Sea Monitor Project we're working on, MARPAM and COMPASS, which are sister projects to this. Uh, the Marine Institute is supporting a lot of this sort of work as well. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's, there's a lot of, there's groups like the Irish Elasm Rank Group who are supporting this sort of work. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, there's momentum yeah. Uh, yeah. to support scientific work that will allow better management of these species. So it's coming, it's coming. It's um, like, uh, we, we just, we just, like, you can't have everything at the same time, but it, I, I wouldn't say it's badly managed at all. I would say, given our state of understanding and the budgets we have here, we're doing the best we can. And I think there's, there's some very good people involved in the management of these species uh, across all levels and, and lots of different sectors, and everyone is pulling together. Like wow. there's, there's a real recognition that these species are under threat. And uh, there, there, there's a real, there's a lot of good energy. There's a lot of effort and there's a lot of momentum. Mm -hmm. That's actually, you know, I, I like that because that's actually sort of, you know, like a positive message despite like, okay, the, the fish is endangered, but there's actually, what I'm hearing from you is a, it's, it's a positive message, you know, which is, which People is. People need to be given out there, not the current crop. 
Yeah. Well, it's I mean, their parents. <laughs> Damn your parents. They, they were the ones that destroyed it all. No, there, there's a lot of energy being put into it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, of, of the angling community as well is, is very supportive of this from, from, mm-hmm. from my understanding of it. Um, they're very keen to, to kind of to employ best practice and how the fish are handled. Yes, uh, um, because there is issues in, in terms of that. We don't know the full extent of, of the issues with handling them, but looking at other species mishandling large lazar branks like this can cause uh, issues with 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 with, uh, with embryos being being aborted or stuff like this by the fish. Mm-hmm. And that's, that 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 is really important when we're talking about a critically endangered species. Yeah, so I want to I want to I want to touch on that. Uh, but just to close off the issue of management and and NGOs. So, do you th- do you? And obviously, you said that you, there's a lot of positive energy and there's a lot of momentum building, which is this 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 positive message. And you know, I'm so glad to hear some conservation related positive message rather than doom and gloom all the time. Um, do you think that NGOs in in Ireland, especially in the Republic, they they need to be more active or there need to be more of them or like what would you, what's, what's your. You, you can't, them? you can't blame the NGOs. Like the, a lot to, from the people I've met in, in groups like the Irish wildlife trust and marine dimensions and all that, they're doing phenomenal jobs with the resources they have. Yeah. They can't do everything. Yeah. Like the, the Irish wildlife trust is, is compared to say the Ulster wildlife trust. The Ulster wildlife trust is maybe 40, 50 people employed. Mm-hmm. The Irish wildlife trust one or two. Mm-hmm. And you know you're talking about if you compare the economies of North and South, mm-hmm. the South is twice the population and an economy five ten times bigger. Yeah. So th- there's a question here that the public here in in the Republic mm-hmm. aren't supporting the NGOs. They're not yeah. joining yeah. in the same level. There, there's a lack of awareness, and this goes down to the schools, mm-hmm. the education program we have. Which when I talked earlier about uh, students thinking that marine biology isn't a viable career option because there's nothing in the Irish seas. <laughs> Well, the opposite is the case. Well, I, I, it's, it's, it's again something that regular listeners to my podcast probably heard me already talking that I, I met a uh, school teacher and she was insisting that there's no sharks in the ocean in Ireland. I mean, like, I, I, uh, uh, you know, my girlfriend showed her a, a picture of me with the shark and she was like, where did he call that? Like, not in Ireland. There's no sharks. Sure. Like, I mean, God damn it, you are a teacher. And you sure a picture, know that there are sharks in Ireland? Show her a picture of some of those six skills Luke is catching in, in County Clare. Uh-huh. Like, uh-huh. those are monsters. Like, like they're, yeah. they're, they're as big as anything you'll get anywhere. Yeah. How, how, do you, do you, are you comfortable talking about the, the six skill sharks? I, mean, this, this I know very little about them. There's a chap at Trinity, uh, Nick Payne, who's putting together a, a project on them at the moment. Yeah. And I'm working with him. And we've put a, we've put a cruise proposal into the Marine Institute for taking a voyage out next year yeah. to, to try and film them. Uh, and, you know, we'll drop some brubs down. We, we might get it. We might not yeah. get it. Hopefully it's a bit of publicity. We get a lot yeah. Of but, uh, and Netflix are keen on filming it as well. But, you know, again, what, what we need we need to expand on, on some of the information we have. We need to know more about them. Yeah, like, these yeah. are amazing creatures. Oh, that I would tell, say me about, ask, tell me about it. Tell me about it. I was strapped to one for an hour and forty five minutes. Nobody knows that about them. Like it'd be amazing to find out more about them. And and this is where I say like the anglers and the fishermen and the scientists and all that same people. Yeah, slightly yeah. different approaches. Like so, yeah. I, I want to find out more about these guys as well. Yeah. I think. How do you? Stuff. How would you? How would you reconcile? How would you reconcile um, the reliance on, on, on anglers on one end and then uh, a lot of criticism from various angles coming from, oh, you're catching those six good sharks, you shouldn't be doing, leave them alone. Oh, you're catching this, this skate and race, uh, they're endangered, you shouldn't be doing that. But then uh, what you're saying, like, oh, there's, there's this like, absolute you know, reliance on, on that data. I, I think this is angling, something I'm struggling with because I, I even put a blog post uh, titled uh, Angling for Critically Endangered Fish, right? Where is this like, should I not do it? Should I do it? Should I do it while I can? Like, how, how, how to reconcile the, the two? Because the obviously you, you, you're violating that. Right? There's a violence, right? This is not nice experience, neither for shark or, or, or skate being <laughs> boated. No, 
No, but if, if, if it's done with the welfare of the animal in mind, mm -hmm. as long as you follow best practice. Now, a lot of this best practice hasn't been published for especially animals like six skill. We don't know how to handle them. Yeah. But there, there are, there's information in other areas, in other countries, where they, we, we can just copy their best practices. Yeah. Now, we also need some scientific studies to assess the efficacy of this best practice. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to do it? Like they might suggest landing the animal on a, on a, on a tarp on a crane or something. Does that make any difference? I don't know. So, so we need sure. to do some scientific studies in, into looking at this. And we can do that. But mm -hmm. again, that, that, that costs money. Yeah. Um, in terms of the anglers fishing for critically endangered animals, it, it's, it's not ideal. It's mm -hmm. not ideal in that the animals shouldn't be critically endangered in the first place. Yeah. Um, why are they critically endangered? It's not, it's, not, it's not the anglers made them critically endangered. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's mismanagement. It, it, it's, 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 it's poorly directed fishing policy or, or whatever in the past towards mm -hmm. these animals. And, and, and you know, we, we can't really comment on that because that's already happened. Mm -hmm. But as far as I'm concerned, we need anglers. The anglers have to realize they have a role to play in the conservation of these species. So they have to be responsible as well. We don't want to see anglers kind of catching these animals, mishandling them, manhandling them to get a good photograph. They have to realize that these are critically endangered species, mm -hmm. that they do need to be careful with them. And, and yeah. they have a duty of care towards the species as anglers. Yeah. Otherwise, they, they, like if, if, you know, if, if they're cowboy anglers and they're mishandling the animal, they give all anglers a bad reputation. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, that's, that's not what's needed because for us to collect the data, to support the conservation of the species, for anglers to continue something that's very important to them, their hobby, for them, for many people to center their life, we have to act responsibly and we, 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 we have to pull together on this. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's, a not, it's not a question of, 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 of me saying this is good or bad. Mm -hmm. It's a question of everybody going, look, what's the, what, 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 what can we do so that these fish survive, so that these ecosystems survive for our children and our children's children? There's a lot of pressures out there. We have climate change, industrial fishing. We've got this issue with microplastics. There's, there's so many awful things happening in the world. These are little things we can do to fight our corner. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I, and I think, I, and I, I, I can't imagine there's an angler out there who, who would disagree with that. that yeah, sort of thing to absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, so what would be, especially now going back to skate, what would be your recommendation um, for best practice of hand, handling uh, skate, uh, even even in the terms of like if I want to go skate fishing, um, because like to me it starts like if I want to go skate fishing, I the first thing like I you know I I might be maybe I have a, my own boat, and then I surely need to prepare that boat in a, in in some way, or more likely I'm going on the charter fishing and then how do I vet a, a skipper or a vessel that he's operate uh, for, you know, proper handling of the skate or maybe how do I inquire a skipper like, Hey, you know, if we caught that skate, how do you going to, how are you going to land this? You know, how are you going to land this? Like, and then when the guy says like, oh, I'm going to guff him and we'll drag him and whatever, then you go like, oh, maybe I will go with somebody else. Like, so how to go about the whole process? But, 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 this is a very difficult question because there are no grants available to the charter boat fishermen to update their boats. Okay. So, so that you can't just go to this guy and he's catching them the same way he's done for 10 years. And now he's been told, well, this isn't best practice. And he's like, well, I can't afford to, to fix my boat up. To do best practice. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I have a huge amount of sympathy for there. And, and that's something that needs to change, that there has to be some sort of way that these guys are recognized and, and given some sort of financial support to, 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 to improve their vessels. I don't know how that works. That's beyond my game. Like, I'm just a scientist. Yeah. No, um, but that's a that's very important point. And it was actually never raised before. And I'm, yeah. and I'm glad you, you said that, that in terms of conservation, there should be grants available for charter skippers. Like, like these guys to, are to, to, to get training, perhaps, get, you know, people don't, you know, I know that, that, that people like, like uh, uh, charter skippers who are handling fish for like two decades, they don't like to hear that they need to be trained, but maybe some of them, but also to update their 
equipment and whether you know put the like a swim platforms to yeah. to land the fish or something well, like there that. has That's to be recognition point. there has to be recognition that these charter boat fishermen um, play a very important role in kind of rural economies they do bring in a lot of money they bring in a lot of tourists so that has to be recognized and i i i i would strongly support any sort of grants or funding that that's thrown their way to allow them to modernize their boats. But again, before they do that, there has to be a, an agreed upon best practice that yeah. involves some sort of science so as we can work out what is the most, uh, what, what is best practice. Now the yeah. Scots have developed multiple approaches towards best practice in terms mm -hmm. of landing, gaffing, holding, mm -hmm. uh, most of which are common sense. For instance, holding the fish up vertically, you don't do, you always hold it horizontally. That That's, okay. That appears to be the, 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 the number one issue uh, because the fish looks superficially fine, but it can cause internal injuries if you hold it up for that photograph. Is it goes only for those big species or is it only for also for small species? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I think the Scots is largely just towards the Dipturus. They're very yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because this is what, like, I remember one of the previous episodes that, that the, you know, what I heard is like, you know, hold them by the like a like a like a flaps of the of the of the head side not by the tail but the, yeah. right I, I honestly i never saw anyone holding skate array by the tail uh, no, but, I, but i but i think like especially you know you can't really hold a big one people have them on deck and they lift them up like this to take a photograph yes that's true that's, that's true that's that looks like it's breaking fish back yeah it's not a good idea it's it's, it's the back not so much the back it's more the this the guts you can affect the guts that way because this is a very large animal, but probably the smaller one is not such a big issue. But with, with, with these, they're very large animals. Their guts weigh quite a lot. They're not adapted to living out of the water. And yeah. when you pull it up like that, you're going to move its guts all around the place because its guts are just big sacks underneath there. And there's nothing really yeah. holding them in. And that can affect the animal's fitness. Now, it might kill the animal, but can it, it can affect its fitness. That means it can affect the amount of energy that animal can put into reproduction down the line. Yeah. Yeah. So again, when you're talking about a critically endangered species, if you're knocking 10, 20 percent off the ability that's of this bad. animal, that, that's that, that's bad. So yeah. and and these things are small. And most, if you look like from, from my understanding and, and interactions with with people, most fishermen, they, they, once once they find out oh cheapers, we shouldn't do that, they don't do it. Yeah. And in, in terms of finding a good skipper, like most of the skipper, I've yet to really come across a, a crazy skipper. Uh, mm -hmm. Some have strong personalities. Some stronger personalities mm -hmm. uh but but uh generally they're, they're all about maintaining their livelihoods and yeah. they're not going to make because they understand that they, they yeah they, 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 understand, under, that they, they understand that they run out of the fish they will have no yeah, to, but, but no anglers they're still like, fishing for <laughs> these are long-lived animals like they, they have decadal lifespans they don't reach they don't reach sexual maturity till they're teenagers mm -hmm. um they, they can you can catch the same fish over and over and over again over decades yeah. So it's not in their interest to damage the fish. Yeah. So I always say, like, if you're if if you're an angler and you're worried about, like, oh my god, is this a cowboy or not? Bring him up, have a chat. And I, I bet you these guys, almost all of them, are going to be like, look, I'll do the best I can. Right. I've been doing this for decades. I've been doing this for years. There's always fish in the same spot. I've caught the same fish over and over again. Mm -hmm. It seems to be working. So, so uh, it seems what I'm, what I'm, what I'm getting from you is like uh, you have a reasonable amount of trust into how anglers and charter skippers are handling. The, the That's fish. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it could always be improved, uh, yeah. but at the moment we have no, we have no evidence to suggest otherwise. Yeah. If um, you, if you can, if you can give me like a three, three main points, what do's and don'ts of keep handling. The, keep the fish horizontal at all times. Don't stick your thumbs in the gills mm -hmm. uh, and return it as quick as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Listen, um, we, we're going to be slowly wrapping this up. Um, in general, how do you see the future of, of the species of skates and, you know, biodiversity and the oceans in general? Um, does it, does it, does it look like at the moment, does it, at the moment look like this is all about delaying the inevitable or is there any you know you think like well this is really relatively young and we all and we just starting this and we need to put up you know more effort and we'll be all right in 50 years so like how 
what's the optimism level? I'm quite this, optimistic. I'm quite optimistic. I'm quite optimistic. I, I think you got to realize that where we live, there's been lots of ice ages. Giant glaciers come down, wipe out everything, and everything comes back. Mm. This isn't the first time we've almost wiped out everything. Mm -hmm. uh, or or not we, the first time we've almost wiped out everything. But it's not the first time things have been affected. And they tend to bounce back. Mm -hmm. That a little bit of leaving things alone, uh, a little bit of uh, kind of more proactive conservation efforts, things will recover. Mm -hmm. And I think people are more aware. Uh, the populace is more aware. Uh, the legislation reflects this. The management reflects this. And I, I'd be in a pretty positive place compared to where we were. Um, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not all rosy. It's pretty, yeah, we have mashed things up quite a bit, uh, but it, it does appear that at least it's, it's steady. And, and they're, they're, with some good people behind the wheel and a lot of effort and a lot of, you know, money and research and pulling together from everyone and good management and some positive legislation, I think, I think everything, we can make a better place for sure. Right, right. I, I, can't, see these, I can't see these species recovering. I can indeed. You can. Yeah, like there's going to be issues uh, in coastal areas with, with, with industrial fishing. Mm -hmm. But I, I think what, one of the things we're seeing up here is that there's very little industrial fishing now because there's nothing left to fish. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that might, weirdly enough, allow things to yeah, 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 um, yeah, gotcha. How long do you think we need to, to see... Well, maybe not only how, how, long, how long we need, but, you know, what are the things that need to happen? And once they happen, how long we need to, you know, see that shifting baseline, but see it shifting other way than they usually shifting? Jesus, that's a big question. Um, I, I think the priority given to the environment uh, has, has, it has to be raised up. Um, like, like you look at... Uh, boats that are caught, and I'm not talking about charter boats, I'm talking about industrial fishing boats, mm -hmm. caught targeting skate, and still mm -hmm. happens, uh, and there's a slap on the wrist. Yeah. Now, if they were caught targeting red deer, if they were caught targeting um, pandas or tigers, none of which are critically endangered, by the way. There's, there's mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, th there, would be, there would be outcry. Yet, when a boat was pulled into Cork a few years ago with a, with a hole full of skate, it got a paragraph in the Cork Examiner. <laughs> yeah. uh, and a slap on the wrist. So I, I think there has to be a, a shift, uh, like some sort of shift, I don't know how, that these are, are like towards these animals, that mm -hmm. they're considered wildlife. Uh, and I, I, think there, I think there's some movement behind that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, otherwise, it's going to be difficult. Right. So, so like a developing uh, different attitude toward wildlife yeah. and nature. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I guess. yeah. So, how, how, what, what would be the time frame you see where, where we should see, like, like if everything goes in the right, you know, if you, if you could, if you could uh, jump into the time machine for, a, for, a, you know, small amount of time uh, to assess whether things recovered or not. Would you go 50 years? Would you go 20 know. years? I don't know. Like, we're, we're doing our baseline now. We don't know how good or bad things are. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we have an idea of where there are concentrations of skate around the Irish coastline. Um, we have no idea of numbers. We have no idea <laughs> yet of effective population size uh, or how viable these remaining relic populations are or if they're connected to each other. Huh. Um, So th there's a lot of unknowns out there. Now, this is what the Sea Monitor Project is trying to address. Mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to look at, we're trying to create a baseline for these species that's independent of fisheries data. Now we're using fisheries data, but this is a, we're, 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 we're not assessing these animals as a fishery stock. We're mm -hmm. assessing them as an animal, as a species in its own way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so we'll know then. If, if depending on what we find, we might find out that there's more of them than, than we thought, that genetically they're okay, uh, or we might find out the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in terms of recovery of these species, you know, you're talking about an animal that takes 14, 15 years before it's actually mature. Mm. So generation times are massive. The threats that, like we have them in relic population still, but the threats that 
stops connectivity between these zones are still there, these big mm -hmm. industrialized trawlers. Yes. Uh, in terms of the Southern North Sea, the Irish Sea, these threats are still there. They're not going away anytime soon. So I think it's a question of managing what we have mm -hmm. and trying to look at areas where maybe they could be supported uh, recovery of these animals as well. Right. Uh, so it's, it's, I, in, in terms of bringing them back to where they were, that's no, not going to happen. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, stopping them from constantly being extirpated mm -hmm. to eventual ex extinction, but maintaining populations of these animals where we do have them, mm -hmm. I think that's very doable. And I think that's very doable in the next couple of years. Oh. Uh, wow. That's fantastic. So it's, it's but, but expecting it to go back to the way it was is a bit like, you know, expecting tigers to be all over India again. It's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. the, the yeah. is, most of the Irish Sea is, 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 and then Southern North Sea, that's essentially farmland now. Yeah. It's for industrialized fishing. But that's not going to be changing anytime soon. Yeah. It's calling for that. Yeah. Um, so they, I, I, they might recover in small inlets and bays, but I can't see a, a wide-scale recovery of a species like that. It, it's, it's managing what we have left and supporting some form of, of spreading out from their hotspots. Right, right. Listen, uh, as, a final, as a final thought, um, any, any piece of advice for, for anglers or people who are involved in, in NGOs or, or anything? Other than that, if they catch a good sea bass, send it to me. I love sea bass. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess get involved, get engaged. Uh, this is more Amy's job uh, than mine, because I just. Uh, but we are um, talk to the IFI, talk to Marine Institute, get information from the Shark Trust, look at what the Scottish have done on their stuff, make yourself aware of the best practice, um, and stay informed. And if you get an opportunity to help us, we'd love your, we'd love to, to for you to come on board. And uh, we we will be doing bits of work in Westport and other areas and all that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if, if they like talk, come to the pub, have a chat with us. Mm -hmm. So how pub. to stay in touch. So how to stay in touch and how to, how to, uh, you know, keep being informed of, 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 of there's, there's, there's a, the sea monitor run a website, mm -hmm. um, that, that we're part of at the moment. That's probably a good way. The, our, our contact person would be Amy Garbett. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also have Natasha Phillips. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they We're supposed were. to have Amy today on the podcast, but she couldn't make it. This is by, by the way to, to to listeners who make this far into the podcast. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can do it again with with Amy. But uh, let's yeah, so, Amy, so Amy, Amy, Amy's far better at this sort of stuff than me as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I had to fill in. But um, no. I, we're we're always keen to engage with anglers and chat to boat fishermen. We're always keen to chat. Um, and, and you know we, we are doing bits and bobs of work around the place and you can find out on the web page or something like that or Amy's got a Twitter thing as well which I, I don't really engage mm -hmm. in Twitter but you'd be able to find out yeah yeah. And we're uh, but you have but you have like you, you have like an awesome avatar on Twitter like a, like a pound one pound gallon one one gallon bucket of omnipotence. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. I would uh, you know if I had one I would give it to you because uh, you're, you're the right guy. To, yeah. <laughs> you would use it in a decent way. But, but I'm sure. again, if if people want to meet up with us, we're always keen to chat. Like we can always learn a lot from the anglers and fishermen as well. And there's always tons of information we can get from those guys. Perfect. Uh, we'd always have projects, masters projects, and stuff like that, that that will involve some level of engagement with 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 anglers and keeping good lines of communication open is is always fantastic. That's fantastic, uh, Patrick. Thank you very much. It's it's been a pleasure talking to you. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.